When I was a kid, I remember learning about centrifugal force. Like, I remember seeing a demonstration, and this guy filled a bucket full of water, and he swung it over his head. And he's like, the water doesn't fall out of the bucket when it's upside down because of centrifugal force. It's the same thing as if, like, you're on a roller coaster and you go through a loop to loop. You don't fall out because of centrifugal force. And I was like, oh, cool, centrifugal force is an awesome thing. And then I got to high school and they told me that it was a myth. And I was like, what? But I saw it. <laughs> yeah, but I saw it, right? So this seems confusing. But let me explain the way it is normally explained in high school. What they're saying is that if you move in a circle like this, what's actually happening is at any moment, your instantaneous velocity, like if you're right here, your instantaneous velocity is like that, right? And then a moment later, when you're over here, your new instantaneous velocity is like this. So even if the magnitude of your velocity remains the same, like you're going around at a constant rate, the direction of your velocity is still changing. You might think there's no acceleration because you're not speeding up or slowing down at all, but force is a vector. It has not only magnitude, but it also has direction. So because your velocity is changing direction, there is a change in velocity, and a change in velocity is an acceleration. So there, you're experiencing acceleration even though you're not speeding up or slowing down. To find what that acceleration is, what that change in velocity is, you have to find the change in velocity. The way you find a change in velocity is you add the two vectors tail to tail, like this. And then the change in velocity is this new vector right here. So your change in velocity, your acceleration, is this arrow right here. So you are experiencing an acceleration inwards. And it's known as centripetal, with a P, centripetal, centripetal acceleration. Um, and you guys have also learned Newton's second law of motion, right? Force, force equals mass times acceleration. So if there's a mass that's experiencing an acceleration, that gives rise to a force. A mass times an acceleration is equal to a force. So because there's a centripetal acceleration, there's also a centripetal force. So, you're not, even though it kind of feels like you're being flung to the outside, like there's a center fleeing force, the force is actually center seeking. That's, that's what centripetal means. It means center seeking force. The force is actually pushing you towards the middle of the thing. And the reason it feels like you're being thrown to the outside is basically because of your inertia. So, Newton's first law of motion now, you guys have learned that uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, right? Pretty much an object in motion wants to continue going at that same rate in that same direction. So your current velocity here, you want to keep going at this rate in that direction, but the centripetal um, force pushes you inwards, and it's your inertia like trying to go tangent to the circle, not some centrifugal force pushing you away. So what you think of as centrifugal force is really just a property of your inertia. That's what you learn in high school. And that's totally valid. That is totally valid from a certain frame of reference. The reason I taught you guys special relativity yesterday was to get you in the mindset of different frames of reference, right? I taught you about how like there's a truck driving along and a pitcher throws a ball on the truck. Someone standing on the ground might clock that ball at 15 meters per second, but someone standing on the truck might clock it at 10 meters per second. Which one's correct? Both. Oh. Both of them are correct. Either one is a valid reference frame. There is no preferred reference frame that is correct. It is true that centrifugal force does not exist from the reference frame. I am standing still. I am watching something else moving in a circle. I am, that is what I am observing. From that reference frame, centrifugal force doesn't exist because of what I just explained. And then I started reading this webcom. It's called XKCD. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of it, but it's awesome. And it's drawn by this guy named Randall Monroe, who used to work for NASA. So this is a NASA scientist who draws this comic, which says, you've got this one guy strapped to that big machine over there, and this other guy says, how do you like my centrifuge, Mr. Bond? I throw this lever, and you will feel centrifugal force crush every bone in your body. And then James Bond says, you mean centripetal force. There's no such thing as centrifugal force. And then 
bad guy says, a laughable claim, Mr. Bond, perpetuated by overzealous teachers of science. Simply construct Newton's laws in a rotating system, and you will see a centrifugal force term appear as plain as day. And then Bond says, come now. Do you really expect me to do coordinate substitution in my head while strapped to a centrifuge? He says, no, Mr. Bond. The little scroll over joke says, you spin me right round, baby, right round, in a manner depriving me of an inertial reference frame of baby. So, basically, even though I didn't really understand it, I read this comic, and Randall Monroe, a NASA scientist, is implying that centrifugal force does exist, at least in a certain frame of reference. And I'm like, what? I'm so confused. Like, this bugged me for years. It literally took me years to figure out what's going on. And I didn't think I would ever figure out what's going on, because we, I read this and I was so confused. I was like, simply construct Newton's laws, like simply, like it's a simple thing to do. Simply construct Newton's laws in a rotating system and you will see a centrifugal force term up here as plain as day. You expect me to do coordinate substitution in my head? Like, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm <laughs> never going to be able to do that. I'm never going to understand this concept. It sounds super complicated but it's actually not. I'm going to show you guys what this means. I'm going to prove to you guys that centrifugal force does exist. If your frame of reference is, I am the thing that is moving in the circle. You define a frame of reference based on something that is not moving. So if I define my frame of reference by the fact that I am not moving, like if you're in a car that's going in a circle and the windows are blacked out, um, you can say, you can adopt the frame of reference that I am not moving. If you want to peek out the window and see the world moving by, from your frame of reference that means that I am still at rest, the world is moving around me. That is a valid frame of reference, and in that frame of reference, centrifugal force does exist. I'll get into the why in a moment here, but that seems kind of weird, right? Changing frame of reference can make a force exist or not exist? That, that seems like a stretch, right? There's no way that can be true. Well, we learned some strange things like that yesterday, um, and let me show you one more. What if I could prove to you that, based on different frames of reference, a force can either be a magnetic force, or in a different frame of reference, it can be an electric force? Yeah, let me prove that to you. Let Derek Muller actually prove that to you. Only a few elements. show you guys what this means. I'm going to prove to you guys that centrifugal force does exist. We've seen why it doesn't exist in this frame of reference. Let me do one more quick example from that same frame of reference. So what I'm imagining here is I'm standing here at rest and I'm observing something moving in a circle like this. I'm going to draw a free body diagram for that object. So the object is right here, so this is going to be towards the ground, this is going to be towards the earth, this is towards the center of the circle, away from the center of the circle. Okay? So what forces is the person in that car experiencing? Force of gravity. Force of gravity, good. What other forces? Normal force. Normal force, good. Force of acceleration. Yeah, Why he's force? experiencing a centripetal acceleration, which means a centripetal force towards the center of the circle, right? And he's not accelerating upwards or downwards, so you know that this force of gravity and this normal force are going to cancel each other out. And this is the centripetal force over here, and it's not getting canceled out by anything because in this frame of reference, centrifugal force doesn't exist. But it's okay that this isn't getting canceled out. When there's a net force on an object, that just means that it's accelerating, and we know that it is accelerating inwards. It's experiencing centripetal acceleration. So that is the valid free body diagram for that frame of reference. But now, let's do that same free body diagram from the other frame of reference. Now, I am the one that is in the car. And because I am defining my frame of reference by saying that I am at rest, in my frame of reference, I am at rest, I know that all of the forces are going to have to cancel out, right? Because if they don't, then I'd be accelerated. And that violates my frame of reference. So. Again, what forces am I experiencing? Gravity. We're experiencing normal. gravity. Mm -hmm. We're experiencing the normal force. I'm still experiencing the centripetal force, but now I've got a problem because these two cancel out just fine. But based on the definition of my frame of reference, this force needs to be canceled out by something else. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't be at rest, and I am at rest because that is the frame of reference I've adopted. So it, it gives rise to the centrifugal force. Centrifugal force has to exist in this frame of reference in order to cancel out the centripetal force. And there's no net force, I am at rest. Everybody follow that? Yes. That's not too terrible, right? Right. That's what this is. Like, what did we just do? We said that because I am at rest, this force has to be canceled out by something else. What is that? That's Newton's third law of motion, right? What's Newton's third law of motion? Law of reaction. Okay. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For something that is at rest, if it's experiencing an action, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. That's Newton's third law of motion. What we just did was to construct Newton's law of motion in a rotating system. And we saw the centrifugal force turn up here as plain as day. Now, what about that little scroll over joke, right? It says, you spin me right round, baby, right round, in a manner depriving me of an inertial reference frame. Let's define this scientifically a little bit here. Inertia, again, Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So it has, it's dealing with objects in motion. So because in this frame of reference, this object is in motion, we consider this to be an inertial reference frame. It is experiencing inertia. But in this frame of reference, because I am not moving, inertia doesn't come into play. This is considered a non-inertial reference frame. So, by spinning me around, you are depriving me of an inertial reference frame, which gives rise to the centrifugal force. That's what this comic means. Let's get to the assignments and to some of the calculations so that you guys can like figure this kind of thing out for yourself. So you guys need some equations to be able to do this, right? So let's get to the math. The equation for centripetal force is mass times velocity squared divided by the radius. So we know that's the equation for centripetal force. Wait, wouldn't that be exact same? Force? Very good. Because of Newton's, Newton's third law of motion says that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. We know that these forces have to be equal and opposite. So it's going to be the exact same thing. If you want to define your direction such that towards the inside is positive and towards the outside is negative, this would be negative mv squared over r, but we're not worrying about direction. We're just worried about magnitude. So Magnitude-wise, centrifugal force has the exact same the exact same formula as centrifugal force. That's not really one that you're going to use in the assignment all that much. Ago, but we still yeah. need to derive some more stuff. In a lot of these equations, I'm asking for like an acceleration due to the centrifugal force. So it'd be really helpful if we had a formula that gave acceleration rather than force, right? Yeah. Well. What's Newton's second law of motion? Force equals mass. Force equals mass times acceleration. So we can replace force here with mass times acceleration. This is the acceleration due to the centrifugal force. And then if we solve for A, we just divide both sides by M, you end up getting A is equal to V squared over R. That is going to be one of the useful equations. A is equal to V squared over R. But V in these equations, what does V mean? Velocity. It means your tangential velocity. So if you're traveling in a circle like this, your instantaneous tangential velocity is like that. It is useful for certain things, but it's also really useful to have angular velocity. What angular velocity tells you is how far along the circle you travel in any unit time. So, the formula for uh, angular acceleration, angular acceleration is given by the variable omega. This is an omega. So, angular acceleration omega is equal to velocity divided by radius. I'm not going to do the whole derivation, but basically you can plug this into this equation. Either say that the acceleration is equal to v squared over r, or you can say it's equal to r times omega squared. 
So these two equations right here are gonna are the two equations that are gonna be really useful for you. Wait, so that's a rad. Okay, yeah, one last important thing. Angular acceleration omega, the units for omega, omega is given in radians per second. If you're using omega, you need to be using it with those units, but that means you might have to convert from something else into those units. Take a look at the third question real quick. The Asteroid and the Wanderers video is spinning at one rotation every two minutes. It gives you an omega, it gives you an angular velocity, but it gives it to you in the form of one rotation every two minutes. So if I go from one rotation every two minutes, how do I get from rotations per minute to radians per second. Rotation is a radian, right? Not quite. One rotation is equal to two pi radians. There are two pi radians in one revolution. So basically now rotation and rotation cancel out, and you now have this in radians per minute. Just convert that to radians per second, again using another one of those bridges.